Swag, my name is Nikki Strong, and this is VOA One The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Coming up on the program, I report on The Lion King's 25th year on Broadway, Gregory Stockel has a story on new words added to the Scrabble Dictionary, and Faith Perlow answers a question from a listener. Later, we hear part one of The Murders in the Rue Morgue, by Edgar Allan Poe. But first, The Lion King turns 25 years old on Broadway this month. The musical first opened in the summer of 1997 at the Orpheum Theater in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Audiences saw something no one had ever seen before. Jumping antelopes, flying birds, and elephants walking through the seats. The audience started screaming so early. When the animals came down the aisle, everybody shot up, said director-writer Julie Tamer. We were just overwhelmed, and we knew we had something. That show in Minneapolis would soon move to Broadway. Broadway is an area in New York City where the largest and most famous plays and musicals are performed. The Lion King would continue to perform for 25 years. It often sells the most tickets per week among all Broadway plays. It is also often young people's introduction to theater. In April 2012, The Lion King became Broadway's all-time highest-selling show. It passed The Phantom of the Opera, which started almost 10 years earlier. With Phantom to close next year, the musical will compete with Chicago for the honor of longest-running show on Broadway. It is easy to forget how revolutionary The Lion King was at the time it was released. Theatergoers were seeing Asian-influenced puppets and masks telling an African story with several African languages. The musical had South African performers and a black king. In addition to writing and directing the show, Tamer also designed clothing and wrote the words for the hit song Endless Night. Her job some 25 years ago was huge. She had to rewrite Disney's popular movie into a live show. She filled the stage with birds flying high on sticks and antelopes marching near the seats. The actors operate giant puppets in a movement popular in 16th century Japanese theater. This is where theater is better than film. It completely surrounds you, Tamer said. I had to use all the tools in the theater toolbox to make it dimensional and theatrical. Tamer did not cover up the wheels and poles that bring her puppets to life. The human beings that control the puppets and wear the animal masks are fully seen. It is the audience's job to add the imagination. She called it the double event. That is where the audience not only watches the animals, they watch humans driving the story, too. The Lion King made Tamer the first woman to win a Tony Award for Best Director of a Musical. Many Broadway stars over the years have also performed in The Lion King. There have been 28 Lion King productions since the first. It has been performed in nine different languages and seen by 110 million people. It has played over 100 cities in 21 countries. Part of its long life is because of the movie connection 
and its simple-to-understand and family-friendly story. But it is also a big production that is not dependent on big-name stars. Before it became a hit, Disney sent its top officials to a rehearsal. One film official suggested Tamer lose the puppetry when it came time for the main characters. She did not agree. Tamer then set up a test at the Palace Theater on Broadway. She presented the musical in three different ways. Just facial makeup, half mask, and her original idea. Then Disney chief Michael Eisner liked her idea. He said, The bigger the risk, the bigger the payoff, Tamer said. How many people say that? Scrabble is a popular word game in which players put letters of the alphabet together to form words. It helps when a player remembers unusual words to use in the game. This month, the game is about to get more interesting, with 500 new words and variations added to the official Scrabble Player's Dictionary. Some of the new words include stan, sitch, convo, zadonk, docks, and fohawk. They will be a part of the more than 100,000 words of 2 to 8 letters in the dictionary. The book was last brought up to date in 2018 through a long-standing partnership between Hasbro, the maker of Scrabble, and the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. Peter Sokolowski is Merriam-Webster's editor-at-large. He said the editors look at the often updated online database at merriam-webster.com to expand the Scrabble Dictionary. But Scrabble players only look for eight-letter words that help them clear their racks for 50 extra points. Sokolowski said the new word Fohawk has the highest possible points for a new word. Fohawk is a haircut similar to a mohawk. Embiggen, a verb meaning to increase in size, is among the unexpected. For example, I really need to embiggen that Scrabble dictionary. Other eight-letter words include hogsbane, more commonly known as giant hogweed, and pranayam, a breathing technique in yoga. The new words include shorter versions of other words, like guac, for guacamole. And there are more variations in the use of nouns as verbs, like adulted and adulting. Sokolowski told the Associated Press, we also turned verb into a verb, so you can play verbed and verbing. Compound words are words created by combining two or more words. In the new dictionary, there are dead name, page view, baby moon, and subtweet. So are words with un, such as unfollow and unsub. They may sound familiar but they were never in Scrabble's official dictionary. The new dictionary includes at least one old-sounding word that simply was forgotten for years. Yeehaw! Yeehaw is like so many of the older informal terms. They were more spoken than written, and the gold standard for dictionary editing was always written evidence. So a term like yeehaw which we all know from our childhood and in movies and TV, was something you heard. You didn't read it that often, Sokolowski said. 
The editors have also added many new words related to food. They include iftar, orchata, kabocha, mofongo, zoodle, wagyu, and queso. Scrabble players, however, only care about scoring more points with the words than their meaning. But if you want to know, iftar is a meal taken by Muslims at sundown to break the daily fast during the holiday season of Ramadan. Mafango is a traditional food from Puerto Rico. Orchata is a sweet drink, and kabocha is a winter squash. For the rest, you will have to look them up yourself. In the last year or two, Scrabble has also removed more than 200 offensive words. They may, however, still be present in older Scrabble dictionaries. Sokolowski would not say what all the 500 new words were. He said the players should hunt them down on their own. And he added, You've got some fun new words. So which new word is his favorite? I like egg corn, Sokolowski said, because it's a word about words. The dictionary says acorn is a word or phrase that sounds like and is mistakenly used for another word. I'm Gregory Stockel. Hello! This week on Ask a Teacher, we will answer a question about if nouns can become verbs. Hello there! Can any nouns be a verb? For example, when it's hot, I fan my mom. When it's raining, I umbrella her. Thank you, Johnny. Thanks for writing us, Johnny. This is a great question. The answer may surprise you. Yes, any noun can be made into a verb in English. It is one of the most interesting things about English. The process is called verbing, or making a verb from a noun. Let's review your two examples. To fan something or someone is an accepted verb, which means that many people use it, and you can find it in the dictionary. This verb means to cool by using a device, like a fan, to create air. So you can totally fan your mom. You can also fan the flames of a fire to make it stronger. But just because a noun can be made into a verb does not mean that it always works or is accepted into the language. We do not yet have to umbrella as a verb in our language. But who knows? If you keep using it enough, you might just verb it. We often see verbing on the internet, especially on social media. For example, the noun friend is now commonly used as a verb. She friended me on Facebook yesterday. We also Google to find information. And since more people study and work from home during the pandemic, we now Zoom or Skype each other. But this process of creating verbs from nouns is not new. We have been verbing for centuries. Some common nouns turning into verbs include 
pencil, table, butter, and voice. For example, I will pencil you in for next Friday. To pencil means to set up a meeting or add someone to a list by writing their name down. Since we are running out of time, let's table this discussion for next week's meeting. To table something is to delay the discussion until a future time. I butter my bread every morning. To butter means to apply butter to bread. And lastly, to voice has two meanings. The first is to tell someone your thoughts, feelings, or opinions about something. She voiced her opposition to the new community plan. The second meaning of voice is to make sounds with your voice, like speaking. For example, at Learning English, we always voice our stories after we write them. If you are interested in learning how words are created and accepted into the language, there is an interesting TED Talk by Erin McKean, who writes dictionaries. Please let us know if these explanations and examples have helped you. What question do you have about American English? Send us an email at learningenglish at voanews.com. And that's Ask a Teacher. I'm Faith Perlow. You just listened to Faith Perlow present this week's Ask a Teacher report. Welcome again to the show, Faith. Hey there, Dan. For this week's Ask a Teacher question, Johnny wrote in about making verbs from nouns. Can you tell us a little more about it? Of course. This process of verbing is very common in English because many of our verbs in their base forms do not have endings. So, it's fairly easy to verb a noun. Some common ones include dance, walk, dream, and work. Do you have any favorite noun-turned verbs in English? I do. It's a little silly. The verb is to loaf. It has an older meaning of to avoid work or activities. For example, I just want to loaf around all day. But that's not why I like it. I like it because the meaning has changed in the past few years. Many cat owners, including myself, now use to loaf for describing how their cats sit, in the shape of a loaf of bread. So you buy or bake a loaf of bread, and it's nice and round and whole, kind of like the shape of a cat when it sits on all of its legs. That sounds a lot like my cat, Marlo. Cats don't do much all day, so loafing seems like the perfect verb for them. Very true, Dan. Thanks for having me. VOA Learning English has launched a new program for children. It is called Let's Learn English with Anna. The new course aims to teach children American English through asking and answering questions and experiencing fun situations. For more information, visit our website, learningenglish.voanews.com. The Murders in the Rue Morgue by Edgar Allan Poe Part 1 Paris it was in Paris during the summer of 1840. 
There and then, I met a strange and interesting young man named Auguste Dupin. Dupin was the last member of a well-known family, a family that had once been rich and famous. Auguste Dupin, however, was far from rich. He cared little about money. He had enough to buy necessities and a few books. That was all, just books. With books, he was happy. In fact, we first met in an old bookstore. A few more chance meetings at such stores followed. Soon, we began to talk. I was deeply interested in the family history, he told me. I was surprised, too, at how much and how widely he had read. More important, the force of his busy mind was like a bright light in my soul. I felt that the friendship of such a man would be for me riches without price. So I told him how I felt, and asked him to come live with me. He would enjoy using my many fine books, and I would have the pleasure of company, for I was not happy alone. We passed the days reading, writing, and talking. But Dupin was a lover of the night, so often we walked the streets of Paris after dark. I soon noticed that Dupin had a special way of understanding people. Using it gave him great pleasure. He told me once, with a soft laugh, that he could see through the windows that most men have over their hearts. He could look into their souls. Then he surprised me by telling what he knew about my own soul. He knew things about me that I had thought only I could possibly know. At these times, he acted cold and emotionally distant. His eyes looked empty and far away. His voice became high and nervous. At such times, it seemed to me that I saw not just Dupin, but two Dupin, one who coldly put things together, and another who just as coldly took them apart. One night, we were walking down one of Paris's long, dirty streets. We were quiet, both busy with our own thoughts. But suddenly, Dupin spoke. You're right, he said. He is a very little fellow, that's true, and he would be more successful if he acted in lighter, less serious plays. Yes, there can be no doubt of that, I said. At first, I saw nothing strange in this. Dupin had agreed with me. This, of course, seemed to me quite natural. A few moments passed. Then it hit me. Dupin had not agreed with something I had said. He had agreed directly with my thoughts. I had not spoken a word. Dupin had read my mind. I stopped walking. Dupin, I said. Dupin, I don't understand. How could you know that I was thinking of... Here I stopped speaking. If he really had heard my thoughts... He would have to prove it. And he did. He said, How did I know you were thinking of Shanti? You were thinking that Shanti is too small for the plays in which he acts. That is indeed what I was thinking. But tell me, in heaven's name, how did you know? It was the fruit seller. Fruit seller? I mean the man who bumped into you as we entered the street. Maybe fifteen minutes ago. Oh, yes, I remember now. A fruit seller with a large basket of apples bumped into me. But what does that have to do with you knowing I was thinking of Shanti? I will explain. 
Listen closely now. Let us follow your thoughts from the fruit seller to the stage actor Shanti. Those thoughts must have gone like this: fruit seller to cobblestones, cobblestones to stereotomy, stereotomy to Epicurus, to Orion, and then to Shanti. He continued. As we turned onto this street, the fruit seller bumped you. You stepped on some uneven cobblestones. I could see that it hurt your foot. You spoke a few angry words to yourself and continued walking. But you kept looking at the cobblestones in the street, so I knew you were thinking of them. Then we came to a small street where they are putting down new street stones. Here, your face became brighter. You were looking at these more even stones, and your lips moved. I was sure they formed the word stereotomy, which is the name for how these new stones are cut. Stereotomy takes a large block and divides it evenly into smaller pieces. You will remember that we read about it in the newspaper only yesterday. I thought that the word stereotomy must make you think of the old Greek writer and thinker Epicurus. His ideas are also about dividing objects into smaller and smaller pieces called atoms. He argued that the world and everything else are made of these atoms. You and I were talking about Epicurus and his ideas, his atoms, recently. We were talking about how much those old ideas are like today's scientific study of the planets and stars. So I felt sure that now, as we walked, you would look up to the sky, and you did. I looked also at the sky. I saw that the group of stars we call Orion is very bright and clear tonight. I knew you would notice this, and that you would think about the name Orion. Now keep listening carefully. Only yesterday, in the newspaper, there was a report about the actor Shanti. The critic did not praise him, and he used a Latin saying that had also been used to describe Orion. So I knew you would put together the two ideas of Orion and Shanti. I saw you smile, remembering the article and the mean words in it. Then I saw you straighten up, as tall as you could make yourself. I was sure you were thinking of Shanti's size, and especially his height. He is small, he is short, and so I spoke, saying that he is indeed a very little man, this Shanti, and he would be more successful if he acted in lighter, less serious plays. I cannot say I was surprised by what Dupin had just reported. My reaction was much bigger than just surprise. I was astonished. Dupin was right, as right as he could be. Those were, in fact, my thoughts, my unspoken thoughts, as my mind moved from one thought to the next. But if I was astonished by this, I would soon be more than astonished. One morning. This strangely interesting man showed me once again his unusual reasoning power. We heard that an old woman had been killed by unknown persons. The killer or killers had cut her head off and escaped into the night. Who was this killer, this murderer? The police had no answer. They had looked everywhere and found nothing that helped them. They did not know what to do next, and so they did nothing. But not Dupin; he knew what to do. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak.